for us, uh, given that we are beaming live to all states and territories in Australia, we should start on time. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Jennifer Petrudi. I'm the chair of the Law Council Charities and Not for Profits Committee. Um, could I start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to thank Chief Justice Alsop and the staff of the Federal Court, and in particular the Federal Court Events Coordinator, Sheridan Chief, uh, for all their work in putting this national event together. Thank you very much. I would also like to say a few brief words about John Emerson AM, after whom this oration has been named. I'm pleased that John Emerson is with us here in Melbourne this evening. When I asked John if the Law Council could name this oration after him, he complained that he wasn't dead yet. <laughs> True it is, but that's all the more reason why we should honour his extensive service to the community, and in particular, his service to the charity and not-for-profit sector. John has been with the law firm now known as Herbert Smith Freehills for 48 years. He was admitted as a partner in 1976 and has recently transitioned to a semi-retired consultant at the firm. His contribution to the charities and not-for-profit sector has been immense. This was recognised when he was appointed as a member of the Order of Australia for services to law and the community, particularly through the provision of advice to charities and not-for-profit organisations, and the development of public administration reform to encourage philanthropy in Australia. John was appointed a member of the Board of Taxation in 2007 and Deputy Chair of that board in 2015. He has guided the reform of the charitable sector with steely resolve and great humility for nearly half a century. Please join with me in thanking John for his contribution today. <laughs> Robert's CV is vast, and I will only mention a, 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 a small proportion of it. Robert has recently been appointed the inaugural New South Wales Ageing and Disability Commissioner. Prior to that, he served as a full-time commissioner on the Productivity Commission since January 2004. He has also served as the Community and Disability Services Commissioner and Deputy Ombudsman in New South Wales. Commissioner Fitzgerald holds degrees in Commerce and Law from the University of New South Wales. He was made a member of the Order of Australia in 1994 and is a recipient of the Centenary Medal. Commissioner Fitzgerald practised as a commercial lawyer in New South Wales for more than 20 years, including with a large national firm prior to establishing his own law practice, specialising in franchising, licensing and trade practices. The Australian Government appointed him to chair the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Advisory Board for three years in 2012. For more than 30 years, he's also been involved in a voluntary capacity in wide-ranging community service. Simply by way of example, he's been President of the Australian Council of Social Service, ACOS, Chair of the National Roundtable of Non-Profit Organisations, State President of the St Vincent de Paul Society, Chair of Job Futures, and a National Committee member of Caritas Australia. In addition, Commissioner Fitzgerald previously served on a number of university advisory boards, including the Queensland University of Technology's Centre for Philanthropy and Not-Profit Studies Advisory Board. Most importantly for present purposes, Commissioner Fitzgerald took leave from the Productivity Commission to sit on the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. I now invite Commissioner Fitzgerald to deliver the inaugural Law Council John Emerson AO oration entitled Lawyers and Their Influence Under the Public Spotlight Will Royal Commissions and Community Expectations Change Legal Practice? Thanks. Well, firstly, just let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we stand. And it's my great hope, as I'm sure it is yours, that in the short term we may be able to develop a shared history and a common and shared purpose going forward. 
Um, I must say it's uh, always a, a delight to be able to talk to lawyers, well I lie generally, um, <laughs> but that's because they fall into three categories. Um, a third are saints, a third are sinners, and the other third are waiting to see which side's going to win before they actually take sides. And in some of the things I'm going to say tonight, that's probably true. Um, it's a great honour to be invited by the Law Council Not for Profit Legal Practice and Charities Committee. It seems an awfully long title, so I've decided we'll just call them the Committee for the Good, and uh, hopefully that's true. Um, Australia needs a vibrant, courageous, a well funded and well resourced uh, charitable and not for profit sector. And the sector needs uh, competent, committed, and compassionate advisors, including lawyers. And today, more than ever, both the sector and those that advise it and support it are essential if we are going to shape the very social fabric of the society within which we live. It's even a greater privilege uh, to be present to deliver the oration um, on the, in honour of John Emerson. And I've known John for over a couple of decades, and uh, that's only a small portion of the 48 years that he's been in this legal game. And he is what everybody says, a man of commitment, competency, compassion. He's loved, admired, and respected uh, by his colleagues and by the sector. And the most important thing, he's an outstanding role model for lawyers generally, but for those that wish to practice in this area. But at least he'd be regarded uh, today that are giving a testimonial at some funeral. I should just say that some years ago I was asked to give an oration on behalf of a, of a prominent Catholic gentleman whom I presumed had died. And I started the speech accordingly only to discover to my shock that not only was he alive, he was sitting in the front seat of his family, but being a good Catholic, we resurrected him throughout the speech, and by the end of it, order was restored to the family and to the gathered few. But John is very much alive. But the nature of John was when I met him a few weeks ago, just in preparation for tonight. And he spoke to me of a particular reading that he reads to young lawyers um, in the firm. And it comes from a report by the Marrero Committee that looked at the legal services system in the state of New York in the 1990s. And John pointed out a particular passage. And if I just read that passage, I think it sets the tone for tonight's talk. It says, the lawyer's role in our society has little parallel with that of members of any other profession or trade. Much of the law and what lawyers do is about providing justice, a principle that few lawyers would hesitate place it nearer to the heart of our way of life and guarding more closely the services provided by other professionals. Goes on to say, lawyers have a special obligation to ensure a legal system that protects the rights of individuals and their political, civil and religious freedoms. And it is lawyers whose business is to ascertain that the political means of government are constrained by the higher bounds of the rule of law. And then this last part, which is the magic of it all, it says, like no other professionals, lawyers are charged with the responsibility for systemic improvement of not only their own profession, but of the law and society itself. But do you believe that? And do we as lawyers, who have practiced in the area, particularly of charity and profits, but more generally than that, do we truly believe that that is the future of law in this nation, and in fact in our own practice? In 2017, in a discussion paper delivered by John McKenzie, the then Legal Services Commissioner in New South Wales, entitled Legal Ethics, What Are They Today? He said this, he said, lawyers belong to a profession that are not just part of a business, though it is a rapidly changing work environment as evidenced by the emergence of digital technology and new models of providing legal services. He said the historical role of a lawyer is one of a servant to the public. The public service claim of the profession of law embodied the ideal of the legal profession as one of the faithful servants. It also embodied ideals of wise and dispassionate advice by a group of learned and privileged representatives who applied their knowledge in the interests of others against the injustices of the state. It is this public service claim that became essential to the purpose of the profession and the real justification for its existence. He went on to give a checklist for young lawyers or lawyers generally about what, it, what you should look at to be an ethical lawyer. But there's one question that he posed, and it said this, ask yourself, does this fit with the kind of lawyer I want to be? And tonight that's the question, or at least it's one of those two questions. 
Tonight, is we should ask ourselves individually and collectively, what kind of lawyer do I really want to be? But the other question is more impressive tonight, is there is a second and more compelling question, and that is what kind of lawyer the community we serve want us to be. Let there be no doubt that all the Royal Commissions have stripped back the veil of secrecy between lawyers and their clients through the suspension of legal professional privilege in most cases. And this stripping back has raised serious questions, not only of ethical conduct, but the very role of lawyers in the advice they give and the way they prosecute criminal and just civil cases. Arthur Moses, SC, um, in two, June 2019, headed in a document, Scandal puts ethics in focus, said, the Lawyer X scandal continues to shock the legal community across Australia as the Royal Commission into Management of Police Informants progresses. There is already consensus among law societies and bar associations around Australia that in response to this scandal, we must strengthen and redouble our efforts to educate both young lawyers and even the most seasoned practitioners on the highest standards of ethical conduct. And he finishes by saying, if the legal profession is to be taken seriously, we must encourage and support lawyers to practice what we preach and ensure we are preaching best practice. But indeed, it's not only the legal community that is shocked, but the community more broadly. Each of the recent Royal Commissions has raised issues of genuine concern. In each inquiry, we've seen the catastrophic failure of institutions, once trusted and respected in our society and community. Misconduct and criminality occurred. When the wrongdoing was exposed, many of the institutions responded without regard to the impacts on clients or customers' adverse effect failed miserably to apply their much touted values, acted without compassion in defending claims and complaints, lacked common decency, and many would say acted unethically. But there are many quotes within the Royal Commission that I was on about that. Just for one, sexual abuse of children has occurred in almost every type of institution where children reside or attend for educational, recreational, sporting, or religious or cultural activities. Society's major interest institutions have seriously failed. In many cases, these failings have been exacerbated by a manifestly inadequate response to abused persons. But then it went on and rightfully found following. The failure to protect children has not been limited to institutions providing services. Some of our most important state instrumentalities have also failed. Police often refuse to believe children. They refused to invest their complaints. Many children who had attempted to escape were returned to unsafe institutions by police. Child protection agencies did not listen to children. They did not, did not act on their concerns. Our criminal justice system has created many barriers to the successful prosecution of alleged perpetrators. Investigation processes were inadequate and criminal procedures inappropriate. Our civil law placed impossible barriers on survivors bringing claims against individual abusers and institutions. But it goes on to say one other thing, and it says this, although the primary responsibility for the child sexual abuse lies with the abuser and the institution of which they were part, we cannot avoid the conclusion that the problems faced by many people who have been abused are the responsibility of our entire society. Society's values and mechanisms which which were available to regulate control, aberrant behaviour failed. Justice Haynes, or Commissioner Haynes, in the Financial Services Banking and Superannuation um, Inquiry said this, there can be no doubt that the primary responsibility for misconduct in the financial service industries lies with the entity, entities concerned and those who manage and control those entities, their boards and senior managers. He went on to say, the conduct I identified was often that which broke the law, and if it hasn't broken the law, the conduct has fallen short of the kind of behaviour the community not only expects, but deserves. What does the community deserve? But the point tonight is, in each of these matters, in each of these inquiries, and the ones being conducted around Australia today in relation to disability, ageing, and the lawyer X matter, lawyers were ever present in most cases. 
not necessarily a point of abuse or misconduct, but in shaping the governance and cultures of institutions and responses to such conduct. Sometimes they were in the spotlight, sometimes in the shadowy recesses, hidden by the mystique that lawyers sometimes encourage about their influence, and most certainly behind the important cover of legal professional privilege. The myth that lawyers simply provide impartial, objective, value-free advice, devoid of personal preferences, biases and values, has been laid bare. Their influence for good and ill should be examined. The community demands no less. And such an examination should lead to serious questions and change conduct or approaches. Equally significant, given the extensive presence of lawyers on boards, management committees, in compliance and risk management uh, bodies, as holders of formal and influential positions in religious and other institutions, how is it that such misconduct prevailed? Was their advice simply ignored? Or was their advice and influence complicit in the failed leadership, governance and cultures identified in recent royal commissions? They were certainly present. And whilst not the focus of the final reports of either the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse, nor in relation to the banking areas, it is true that their presence mattered. And it is subject to scrutiny and to questioning. Some in our profession will resist such examination as unjustified, intrusive, and professionally insulting. They, like some in all institutions, deny the truth that has been revealed in recent inquiries. They deny this, no, this because knowledge it raises will force us to answer very significant questions. Such challenges ultimately lead us to change or reform. At the moment, in religious institutions, there is a group of deniers. And they deny the very truth of what has been revealed. But to accept any portion of that creates challenges which would require a response. And in order to protect that which they want, they will not enter into the very nearest acceptance of the truth. The same will be true in all professions. And it is true in business. I was on the Productivity Commission inquiry into executive remuneration, which looked at the remuneration of the CEOs and boards of Australia's top 100 companies. And in meeting after meeting, boardroom after boardroom, lunch after lunch, because they only talk when they're eating, um, they would be shocked as to why the community had any right at all to raise these questions. Nine out of ten directors, without hesitation, were infuriated that the government had bowed to the pressure of the community to hold inquiry. And yet in every meeting, there would be one or two who said something different who got it, who understood that we all live within some form of social contract with each other, however you define that. And yet they were the exception. And today, I would hope in the legal profession, when these challenges are presented, they are not the exception, but the majority. What they will never be is everyone. Many are satisfied with how we and the profession operates, yet the community isn't. And increasing denial of our governments. The recent Productivity Commission report into civil justice demonstrated the lack of access to much of our legal system. In part, this is due to government funding and resourcing. But some is due to our own conduct and practices. Do we really believe that the community should remain silent in the face of such evidence? Now, just as John Bowsett in October 2004 at the Cook University said this, as lawyers, we bear great responsibility, but the rewards are generally not inconsiderable. It is a mistake to assume that the law as we know it and the profession as we know it are all of the ultimately perfect results of generations of social evolution. Both institutions must continue to change if they are to remain relevant. We must be alert to the need for change so that we can ensure that it occurs in a considered way. The law and the profession exist and operate in a world which itself is changing rapidly. We must change at the same pace. Tonight, I think there are five questions that largely arise out of a number of the Royal Commissions. And I won't have time to deal with them in detail, but I want to raise them at the beginning and then reflect on some cases and some matters that sit behind them. The first is, will the nature of advice need to reflect or at least take into consideration the values and the ethical context 
of our clients? Will we need to comment on the notions of fairness and ethical conduct in the advice we now give? So that's one. The second is, will we lawyers need to not only advise clients on what is legally allowed, but, as Justice Haynes said, is the right thing to do, especially when vulnerable people are adversely affected by such advice and the subsequent conduct by our clients? Will lawyers need to exercise greater care in their personal roles in exercising influence beyond formal legal advice? And do they have an ethical responsibility to contribute to the good governance and culture of institutions upon which they have such influence just by being there and by just being a lawyer? We come back to that. Will lawyers need to be more open to supporting reforms of the criminal and civil justice systems to give even greater access to all Australians and to promote just outcomes, especially for vulnerable people? Will lawyers need to recommend or support the use of moral litigant principles in non-government organisations when dealing with vulnerable people? What is clear from all of the Royal Commissioners is that all of the Royal Commissioners are now asking for something different of the legal profession. They are in fact moving us into the space of ethics, not only of our own ethics, but the ethics of our clients. Let me come back to that in a moment. But the starting point, I think, is that ethical issue. Commissioner Mackenzie quoted Elizabeth Shaw from the Ethics Centre in Victoria in 2016. And she wrote this, the world of ethics is made up of more than just moral rules and compliance. Ethics is a philosophy of living and being, personally and professionally. It is about relationship. It is about context and connection. It is as much about emotion and intuition as it is about reason. The main enemies of ethics are hypocrisy. When we do things that are odds with personal and professional values and unreflected practice when we don't critique our own work. Let's be very clear that in relation to the institutions that we look at in the child sexual abuse, hypocrisy reigns supreme. Organisations that have stated values, moral positions, positions which have talked about love, justice, compassion, fail to deliver it in spades. Organisations in the Financial Services Royal Commission that talked about putting the interests of the customers first were shown to be hypocritical in the extreme. But organisations do nothing. Institutions do not write and speak. Only people do. So who are the people that made those decisions, that placed values and practice in such a disaligned or unaligned state? In a paper entitled, or a speech I think it was, uh, Government Lawyers, the Moral Compass of Their Organisations by Karen Berkeley, she quotes Robert Ridley, who I think is the AB, IBAC Commissioner in Victoria. And he spoke to a group of lawyers, um, and I presume this is in 2019, in June. He said, you are the lawyers of, to these organisations. You have to make sure that your organisation is always aligned true north and that its moral compass is right. Government lawyers needed to ensure they gave honest, fearless advice and to recognise that they played a role in building a culture that was ethical and followed proper procedures. Is that the role of lawyers? Not only in government, but non-government commercial organisations generally. Is Commissioner Redley right that you have to make sure that your organisation is always aligned true north and the moral compass is right? It's my contention that not only government lawyers must face true north. Indeed, all of us must, both in our professional and private lives. And do you think the community would find that exceptional? Do you think the Australian community would find it unexceptional to say to lawyers that you have to play a positive role in the shaping of the culture of the organisations, both as clients and those that you are, in fact, part of? It seems unremarkable to me. And yet it's deeply contentious within the profession, and it is a change or the way in which we see our role. And maybe there are dangers. But let's go on. One of the things that became clear in the Royal Commission that I was on was the role of lawyers in their personal capacity beyond the giving of professional advice. For some reason or another, on boards and committees where lawyers sit, they take on almost a mystical and superior position just by being there. And lawyers know it. 
Anybody who says, oh, I'm just a member of the board and I'm just equal with everybody else, well, he may be kidding himself, but he kids no one else. Because we all know that for reasons of, of perhaps of history, that's not how people perceive the role of the lawyer. We saw this over and over again in relation to many institutions in our own inquiry. And subsequent to the Banking Royal Commission, I've heard it said by many people at many forums. And so let's just accept that for the truth. In a case study into the Anglican Church in Newcastle Diocese was highly illustrative of such influence. A small group of lawyers were able to exercise significant influence in the life of the diocese over a very long period of time, covering the terms of several bishops. Without commenting on their professional advice, such influence was often prejudicial to the welfare of victims and survivors, and prejudicial to those within the church that sought to expose and address the issue of child sexual abuse within the Anglican community. Equally, in relation to the Banking Royal Commission, those same issues have been raised. And it begs the question whether or not lawyers have become institutionalised. That is, they have taken on the characteristics of the institutions that they provide advice to. And it's self evidently true that many lawyers have become so close to the institutions that they, they now provide advice to that their objectivity may in fact be in doubt. This is not so much in their professional capacity, but they're on boards and committees of churches and of clubs of non-profit organisations. They seek and seek out board positions of wealthy and uh, uh, wealthy and, and substantial listed companies. It's part of the career development strategy. In the end, that close proximity may come at a price. Now, am I suggesting for one moment that people or lawyers should be banned from being parts of committees and boards? No. But I am saying the evidence is overwhelming that where the closeness gets too close over too long a period, then a form of institutionalisation does take place. Contrary to that is, of course, the expertise and knowledge and experience that you gain and bring to the table. So how do you balance this? In the Anglican case, it is clear that the balance wasn't kept. And that's only one of numerous examples where we saw that same sort of scenario apply. The other is the ethically challenged or fair lawyer. And this is really relating to what I talked about whether or not we will need to talk and give advice about fairness and ethical conduct beyond what the law currently requires. In the Banking Royal Commission, Commissioner Haynes was very clear. He said, because, this, because that is how every financial service entity named in the Commission's reports must look to its culture, every financial services entity must look again at the way in which it governs itself and manages not only its employees, but also entities and individuals who act as intermediaries. In looking at culture and governments, every entity must consider how it manages regulatory compliance and conduct risks. And it goes on. But then he says these things which are very important. As I have said, the culture of an entity can be described as the shared values and norms that shape behaviours and mindsets. It is what people do when no one is watching. And that is a perfect statement. I was giving a talk the other day about governance to a group, and I said if there was a video camera in this boardroom, it was an award, would you be proud of your conduct? Would you be pleased that the outside world could see how you make decisions, and what decisions you make, and what values you pick, and what values you trade away? He went on to say these things. He said, first, culture of each entity is unique. It may vary widely within different parts of the entity. Secondly, there is no single best practice for creating or maintaining a desirable culture. But he goes on to say a number of things that should be looked at. Obey the law, do not mislead or deceive, act fairly, provide services that are fit for purpose, deliver services with reasonable care and skill, and when acting for another, act in the best interest of that other person. And then he says, third, culture cannot be prescribed or legislated. If you look at those summary, that changes the nature of the way in which not only institutions should conduct themselves, but the way in which lawyers need to advise. What's very clear from Justice Hayes' comments is that lawyers and others will need to be able to provide advice on fairness. Now, of course, in relation to consumer protection laws, 
We do that in relation to misleading and deceptive conduct. We certainly do that in relation to unfair contracts, and we do that in relation to unconscionable conduct. But this is much more than that. And in a sense, the big lesson out of the Royal Commissions is that. Fairness. Is it such a weird concept? When I was on the inquiry into the Australia's consumer protection laws, much of which you have to live with today, regrettably, um, a big issue was around unfair contracts. Europe had them, many other jurisdictions did, but there was great anxiety in Australia as to whether or not we should introduce the notion of unfair contracts. Surprisingly, the world did not fall in when they were introduced. And most of the naysayers' arguments have disappeared, but we considered those. But this is much broader. The general nature of a client acting fairly. Now the trouble with this is, would the community trust us to know what that is? Are lawyers the best people to know what fairness is? I'm not quite sure the community thinks so. And when I learn the notion that lawyers should in fact be the people telling others about ethics, God help us, I would say. You know, this is truly putting the fox in charge of the head house. But is it really? If we believe what I started with, the answer is no, it can't be. Because the very essence of the profession, it's very right to exist, it's very purpose, is based on some of those notions, no matter how we have drifted from it in some cases. Lawyers will say to me that this goes far too far. I've already heard people say that Justice Hay has gone far too far, both in terms of institutions and, of course, those that advise them. But the question that was raised by Hain, it was actually first put by the Commonwealth Treasury and adopted by Commissioner Hain, was this. What more can be done to achieve effective leadership, good governance and appropriate culture within financial service firms? That so that firms available or do not mislead or deceive are fair, provide different purpose service and act in the best interest clients? Well, my question is, what role will you play in answering that question? That's the challenge. You can look to the boards on which lawyers sit, but at the end of the day, do we have a role in that? And so the next question is this. Are we going to start to provide legal advice that is not only about what you can do, but what is the right thing to do? And that's ultimately what Justice Hayne put to many witnesses. He said to a number of the witnesses, when did you ever think this was right? And of course the witnesses bubbled and bubbled as they do. Interesting though, what you've said, they said that to the lawyers. When did you ever think this was the right advice to give? Were they fumble or bumbled? I'm not so sure. Commissioner McKenzie again talked about integrity. He said, a definition of integrity is the promotion of behaviour that adheres to moral and ethical principles. So compliance is only a precondition to achieving integrity, which our pre pre profession strives to attain. Something more is required for, of lawyers. Something in the nature of an obligation to abide by moral and ethical principles. And Haynes basically said that in relation to institutions. But are there challenges? In an article headed High Court Failed to Bolster Standards by Richard Gullias, uh, which uh, Jennifer said to me, I think, they quote um, a lawyer, um, an Arnold Block lawyer, Leon Swire, I think he is, I'm not sure he's last name, and he said this, clients often don't want legal advice which is holistic where the partner raises broader concerns, such as community standards, he says. They just want to know how to get the deal done, quickly and efficiently, in accordance with the black letter of the law. They don't want legal advice that's perceived as meddling or obstructive to their business objectives. Is he right? And if he is right, how do we change the nature of clients? How do we change the nature of institutions who seek our advice? Because it certainly resonates with me that there are many clients that won't want you meddling in the ethical um, or, or, or pontificating on what is fair beyond the law. So his question or his proposition is sound, but it's incomplete if we put a full stop there and say, well, it's all too hard. They don't want us to do it. Because I don't think that's true. And my point is, I don't think governments will think that's true either. Let me be very clear. We may at the moment be looking at what Royal Commissions say. We may well be looking at what community expectations are. But governments are hovering very clearly and carefully considering these issues. In a case of, I'll be careful, by Ronald Dutton against Worsley, 
A Lord Reed said this, as an officer of the court concerned in the administrative justice, legal practitioners have an overriding duty to the courts, to the standards of his profession and to the public, which may and often leads to a conflict with his client's wishes or with that with what the client thinks are his personal interests. One of the challenges going ahead is this notion of what is in the best interest of the client. And one thing that is very clear, it is more than putting the client first. One of the great challenges in the financial advisor area arising from the Royal Commissions is that many of their codes of conduct talk about putting clients first, but not acting in the best interest of the client. Justice Hayne says that's not appropriate. That is actually about acting in the best interest of clients. And that's going to be a matter of contention. But if it's simply a weighing up between my interest as the advisor and that of the client, then maybe, if that's all it is, it is the client's interest the first. But a best interest concept is much greater than that. So let us ask this question. Of the advice that was given to institutions in the child sexual abuse 30, 40, 50 years ago, how much of that advice ultimately was proven to be in the best interest of the clients? If the main issue was to protect the reputation of the institution and its resources, surely history has shown it has failed. Who today believes institutions that put the reputation of their institution first in the denial, silencing and defeating of claims of victims, ultimately causing enormous damage not only to victims, but surely to the long-term reputations of the institutions themselves. But again, how can lawyers construct a notion that the simple victory in the court today is actually necessarily in the best interest of the client? If we had time, we could look at some of those civil litigation matters and I'll briefly talk about them. But many of them were played hard, harder than you could possibly um, imagine. Why? It was, the, it was not only to defeat the individual who has already suffered a great deal, it was to in fact make sure that further claims would not come forward. And there was great rejoicing with each time a victim was in fact denied justice. For that reason, 20 years on, 30 years on, which of these organisations stands in the marketplace of ideas and values untarnished by those approaches? None of them. Yet lawyers' advice is consistent in every single matter they went to the courts where that is the case. You'll see in the document which comes to this time and time again, it was lawyers providing that advice. Or was it the client instructing you? Nobody knows. This notion that the client gives you instructions and you act independent on that, well, that's a fiction. When you look at the way the institution said, I simply took the advice of a lawyer. He doesn't say, I instructed the lawyer often. He or she wouldn't know what that meant, really. Because they fell out of their depth. Lawyers controlled much of the action. Not in some cases, I'll come to one in a moment. In a case uh, study which we looked at the scouts, the scouts in Australia, um, responded to complaints and allegations in a, with a primary concern with a desire to protect the reputation of Scouts Australia and only ever acted on the advice of insurance. In another case in relation to the Hutchins School in the Anglican Diocese of Tasmania, the school board of management refused to give apologies to a survivor of a child's sexual abuse to avoid or limit reputational damage to the school without regard to the impact of that denial on that particular child, now adult. In several Catholic orders, the church's reputation when responding to allegations of child sexual abuse uh, was always paramount. The question there is, what does that mean for lawyers going forward? Should lawyers now deal explicitly with the values, ethos or mission purposes of the institution when giving advice? Or should they at least be required to raise that? So let us take this proposition. If you were prepared to provide advice in relation to your legal options, would you not say at the end of that advice that you should ask the following questions? Or you should consider this advice in the context of your values, your ethics, your mission and statement of purpose? Is that unreasonable to expect? At least it would pause or make the conversation very relevant around those issues. But I'll give you an example of that in relation to disability service. When I was community disability service in New South Wales, and I've used this before, 
they created an adverse finding in relation to disability service. I went to the board to discuss the adverse finding. They asked me to stay on the board meeting. My first big mistake was to say yes. The next piece of advice was from a lawyer in relation to what they called um, occupational health and safety issues. And the lawyer recommended that the disability service should, could no longer continue to provide community access to the disabled that was in their care. The board was about to accept the advice. And I said to them, well, can I just make a comment? I said, you've got a choice. You can either remain in a disability service or you can come in jail. But if you accept the advice, you've chosen the latter. The advice was not contextual as to the disability standards. It was not contextual as to the main purpose of these community-based services, which is community access. It was not contextualised as to the values or anything else. I couldn't blame the lawyer, but you know, I don't do that. I, but the board was about to accept it. Now, it's very curious to me, had there been a paragraph at the end of the day at that saying, I think you should need, before you accept this advice, you should consider the following. How different the outcome might have been. Let me be clear, however, and this is the challenge. It is not the job of lawyers to be the moral guardians of their clients. And that is the challenge. So raising the questions where the, where the institution itself has already publicly stated these are our, our values is quite appropriate. It's not for you to tell the organisation what the values should be. Except maybe in relation to fairness, maybe in relation to ethics. But it is your job to raise them. Well, if you don't, who will? So we've seen many lawyers throughout the time, both in all of these institutions, that I think have in fact raised those questions. The evidence of that is many of the changes. In our, my own inquiry in relation to child sexual abuse, we did see many lawyers who in fact helped develop redress schemes, did change the way in which civil litigation was fought. We did see um, you know, very formal processes with the aid of lawyers, such as the introduction of towards healing in the Catholic Church. So to in governments where there was systematic abuse of children in their care and a hostile reaction to providing assistance, we saw significant changes guided by government lawyers. And much of the credit goes to advocates for victims who struggled for decades against strident opposition both by institutions and the burdens of various of civil and criminal justice systems. But let me just um, I can say a couple of quick points and examples. I want you just to think, if you can, in relation to those two systems and how, in fact, the law profession plays both in the criminal and civil justice areas. Now, Justice Mer Marrero, again, in that same document, that same commission, says, it is evident abusive lawyering remains pervasive under the existing rules. And it's not the procedural rules themselves that account for litigation extremes and inefficiency, inefficiencies they encounter in court proceedings. In another article from the US, uh, Professor Nathan Greystall put this. He said, for a number of years, scholars of the legal profession have debated whether the role of lawyers in an adversarial system is morally defensible. According to one group, the traditional standard conception of lawyers' role is characterised by neutral partisanship. Lawyers are bound to represent their clients zealously without incurring any moral responsibility for their actions. Critical of this amoral position, these scholars have sought in various ways to introduce moral obligations into the lawyer's role. A second group of scholars, um, defenders of the role of lawyers in the adversarial system, has attacked both the critics' description of this role and their claim that zealous representation in an adversarial system is morally unsound. Now that was a debate going on in America in 1998. I'm not quite sure I heard that debate in Australia, but there are elements of it present. So let me just go to the crutch of I can in relation to a couple of these matters. When we actually look at the way in which law was practiced both in civil and criminal matters, we see that there are in fact variations of approaches. Let's just take one aspect of the civil law which the Royal Commission found to be highly inadequate for victims of child sexual abuse and made significant recommendations in relation to changes to it. It looked at two areas in relation to civil matters. One is in relation to a proper defendant. Now, as you would be aware, there were numerous examples where institutions denied to the claimant a normal defendant. 
at all times during all matters was open to these institutions to provide one, and most of them did not. And we looked at several case studies in relation to this. Let me just read one, however, and more famous one, and that is in case study 8 on Towards Healing, we heard evidence about the civil litigation concerning John Ellis and the allegations that they had were pressed to Aidan Duggan. Ellis could not sue the Catholic Archdiocese of Sydney because it was an unincorporated association, and he commenced um, action against individual defendants and trustees. It held that the court, that the Cardinal could not be legally liable for the abuse of Mr Ellis, that's Cardinal Cole, because he was not Archbishop of Sydney at the time. The abuse occurred and could not inherit any legal liability of the predecessors. It goes on. However, evidence given was that the Archdiocese of Sydney followed its legal advice and did not provide information to Ellis's lawyers about who the proper defendant in the proceedings should have been. We can go on to a number of cases involving the Christian Brothers, the Anglican Diocese of Grafton in the North Coast Children's Home, um, in relation to the Melbourne response um, concerning the Foster family. Now, in all of these circumstances, a proper defendant or a nominal defendant could have been put forward. What would have been the consideration of the lawyers in providing advice to the religious institutions in this case? And it is interesting that all of them say um, that the lawyers were, in fact, very much part of that decision. Although it is true, Archbishop Hart, then Archbishop of Melbourne, and one of the defendants, or by the Foster family, said he effectively gave his lawyers instructions to take all defences that were open to the church in defending the matter. He said he, that he was dependent on his legal advisers. However, his lay reading was it did not seem right to him that he and the Roman Catholic Trust Corporation were legally liable for the crimes committed by Father O'Donnell in this particular matter. It is true that Archbishop Hart gave evidence later that he now is of the view the Catholic Church should provide victims with an entity to sue. My point about that is not the actual decision. It's one of the considerations that a lawyer should put in relation to those sorts of matters. Is it simply that you're right, that they're in fact at war, and the Ellis case, nobody disputes the legal findings of that case. But is that where you stop? Or would you say that you have the capacity to put forward a defendant? And these are the pro these are the positives and negatives of so doing that in relation to the claimant. What considerations should be made with the particular client? The community is rightfully concerned and sometimes angered when they see an institution with obvious wealth fail to accept responsibility by failing to put forward a defendant denying the most vulnerable, even the remotest chance in a just response. By refusing to put forward a defendant, you deny that person all opportunities for a just response. The second is around moral litigant, and I won't go on about that, other than to say this goes to the heart of which um, matters, civil matters particularly, are dealt with. And we examined the role of moral litigants um, in relation to a number of the state governments which haven't. Suffice is to say, in a number of cases, they would not apply. In New South Wales, there was a case involving the most vulnerable women I've ever seen from an institution called Beth Car, perhaps only equivalent to those that came out of uh, Paramount Girls Home. And yet in that case, the lawyers, a gaggle of lawyers, both from the Crown and from barristers, failed to apply the involving litigant approaches. They failed in a number of ways. They failed, they, and the Director General spoke about it. He said the breaches involved issuing a request for particulars about mental matters which were in the state's knowledge, attempting to acquire, require the claimants to separately file a statement of claim and have each claimant separately run their case, and there were multiple claimants, requiring the plaintiffs to make complaints which led to the convictions and guilty plea of the offender to prove that the sexual abuse alleged, alleged in the statements of claim actually occurred, when it was well believed that it had occurred, not agreeing to attend early mediation, not offering an early uh, apology, and so on. So even in governments where we have moral litigants, they weren't followed. Why? Well, the reason was when the evidence was given by the lawyers, all the barristers, and all the solicitors. One barrister, frankly, didn't believe a moral litigant approach was appropriate. He, on the one hand, said, yes, I followed it. On the other hand, clearly didn't. 
his view was it was like treating any other matter. It was clear from the evidence he had no intentions ever of actually running a case using that matter. And he's subsequently not been used by the state government involved as a consequence of that evidence. But why would you take that view when you're dealing with the most vulnerable people? Why would you take that view? Well, let me just read this. Father George Pelt and then Archbishop of Sydney, and this is in the um, published documents. He said of the case in Ellis, he said, the legal battle was hard fought, perhaps too well fought by our legal representatives who won a significant legal victory. I would now say, looking back, that these legal measures, although effective, were disproportionate to the objective and to the psycho psychosocial state of Mr. Ellis, as I now better understand it. He went on. With any litigation, my approach all overall is always to retain competent lawyers and to expect that they will conduct the litigation in an appropriate, professional manner, relying on their expertise in the field. I do not consider myself to have the experience or the knowledge to make decisions about the day-to-day -day running of illegal claims. I have reflected on the course of the litigation, and there were several steps taken in the course of the litigation, which, as a priest, now cause me some concern. The question, the challenge for that is, that is typical of most of the witnesses. That is, they did not believe that they had the competency to be able to, in fact, really do anything other than what was advised. Now, some of the lawyers may disagree with that, and I don't pretend in that case or any other case to understand the inner workings between the lawyer and the clients, only the state of evidence. As a consequence of all of that, however, the Royal Commission did come forward with a number of guidelines, or purporting a number of guidelines, in relation to child sexual abuse. These guidelines have been developed by the Victorian and New South Wales governments, and they are not the model if you can approach, but they have elements of them. The question for me is, are there other circumstances where such approaches could be adopted by non-government organisations? What factors should lawyers have regard to advise in such approaches? Do these more moderate approaches actually work in favour of the long-term best interest of the organisation, as well as to reduce the stress to vulnerable claims? And that is true even in commercial organisations. Short-term victories may become replaced by long-term ethically-based outcomes. My point is, is that all the community wants? The community probably will always cast doubt on the justice systems, but if they are to have faith in them, and they should, then at least an element of fairness in the way in which matters are prosecuted and dealt with should be present. Nothing is simple in this space, but you will say to me, yes, but what about the way in which insurance companies require them to be in charge of the proceedings? What about my peers? What about a whole range of other matters? The challenge is, can we in fact moderate and change our approaches, particularly where there is vulnerability of the clients? So let me conclude, just so that there's a couple of moments for benefit to raise some issues. Um, towards a just system, the Productivity Commission report highlighted in full the weaknesses in the civil litigation area. None of those would be a surprise to any of you. It said, uh, it quoted Justice, Chief Justice of Western Australia, Wayne Martin, the hard reality is that the cost of legal representation is beyond the reach of men, probably most of in Australians. In theory, access to that legal system is available to all. In practice, access is limited to substantial business enterprise, the very wealthy and those who are provided with some form of assistance. The Law Council of Australia said disadvantaged Australians in particular face a number of barriers in accessing civil justice. These include communication barriers, a lack of awareness and resources. The disadvantage that these individuals will face mean that they are more susceptible to and less equipped to deal with legal disputes, and so on. Let me quote then, returning to where John Emerson first took me to the Marrero Commission. And he takes it to the individual. Let me conclude with two paragraphs. He says, we believe that lawyers, independent of their ordinary duty as citizens, have a professional responsibility to mobilise their own resources in order to meet these needs. The duty flows from the lawyer's role as a professional and as an officer of the court, and arises particularly from the lawyer's possession of unique training and skills, and of the exclusive publicly granted franchise to practice law. 
M includes the responsibility of the lawyer both to provide legal services to those that need them and to respond to the systemic challenge that we have described is not only collective and borne by the bar as a whole, it is singular and individual to each lawyer as well. It is an insufficient response for individual lawyers to expect that some amorphous entity comprising the profession will respond to the needs we have found to exist. Each lawyer has a responsibility to make that response. And lawyers fail the poor, the public interest, the profession, and themselves as persons when they fail to do so. Let me just finally say, I applaud the many lawyers here who have in fact committed their time, resources and skills to those most disadvantaged through pro bono activities, legal aid work, community legal centres, and many justice uh, initiatives. I acknowledge the commitment of the professions to its service in the cause of the public good. I particularly want to acknowledge those who have worked for the betterment of the charitable, not for profit sector, and for the rights of the most vulnerable. We thank you. And finally, let me say, there is a thing called an honourable lawyer. And an honourable lawyer is somebody that has the qualities, the compassion, um, the empathy and understanding of John Emerson. And hopefully we can emulate John a truly honourable lawyer. I wonder whether it might be appropriate to uh, target the hip pocket and to say that a lawyer is not giving his or her client value if they are not giving them this independent advice and advice on their culture and fairness. Well, I think that what the world commissioners have been saying, but others have been saying, is exactly that. The notion of best interest or acting in the best interest of the client has by some lawyers been simply turned into, I won't put my interests above that of the client. That cannot possibly be the whole story, but it is part of the story. The second thing is, what is actually in the best interests of the client? What is very clear in the minds of many lawyers, perhaps under the instruction of uh, institutions, was a short-term victory was in fact in the best interests. But if you actually see the way in which the world now operates, no longer will the veil of secrecy in relation to legal professional privilege apply the way we thought. What you're thinking is that your strategies will, or could, with royal commissions, become exposed. And in the light of day, it appears that these are not in the best interests of the client. Ask the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Salvation Army, the Scouts today, whether looking back 20 or 30 years ago, the quick victories were in fact in the long-term best interests of their clients? And the answer is no. Nobody says that today. So I think they give you the answer. The challenge is to construct a framework which doesn't leave lawyers into hands for which they have no expertise and for which the community would have no trust. And I think that's a great challenge going forward. Um, I, I, just one final question. I think that the courts themselves are demanding that cases are being conducted in a more ethical way by lawyers, so that the model litigation rules are in effect being carried into operation. You see in Victoria the Civil Procedure Act, and, and I think perhaps it might be moving towards a situation where um, a, a, a barrister has a particular obligation to a court when you are opposed by a self-represented litigant, and I wonder whether it might be appropriate for us to look at whether or not that sort of an obligation should be um, uh, in, implied where, where you are, your client is a large organisation um, opposed to a, a victim. So I think the issue there is these two new principles for litigation in relation to child sexual abuse by New South Wales and uh, Victoria, I think, are the beginning of something much greater. Their application is to child sexual abuse. But what we're now starting to see in Australia is the notion of vulnerability, governing for the vulnerable. You know, my new role as Ageing Disability Commission, for the age, which only have one quality, that is I'm ageing, uh, is an example of us moving into spaces of vulnerability. Vulnerability and dependency are the two things that go together. When you look at what is being proposed in those principles, they just seem sensible. But I won't go through them all. But they, they are about, the outcomes are meant to minimise potential further trauma, 
uh, to reduce unnecessary adversarial aspects. You know, consistently applied across groups of the same standard, that is vulnerable people. You know, they're, they're fairly simple and sensible proposals, as is the model if you can approach. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say you would want to apply those to pure commercial arrangements. That is the test on who, who is impacted by those decisions or those actions. It is the test about the imbalance, the power imbalance that cannot be moderated. Or is it about vulnerability? Or is it about something else? So what is it that triggers us to say these principles should be applied? Now, I don't have the answer for that. What I can say is it won't stop a child's sexual abuse victims, and it shouldn't. How far it goes, however, I think is a very uh, important discussion for the legal profession in Australia, as it will be um, overseas. But what is the triggering event that says we do it differently? Uh, I think that's going to be the great challenge. The principles, I think, will fall out fairly easily. Thank you. It is the witching hour, so um, could I uh, once again thank uh, Mr Fitzgerald for his fabulous uh, address. It's been, personally for me, very inspirational, and uh, would you join with me in thanking him for it?